Working Cows Podcast, Episode 81. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm-challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Well, last week on the main episode that I released, I closed with a a plea for someone to start a sheep podcast because there is obvious demand for it and uh, obvious forward-thinking people in the sheep industry. And Dave Ola is a multiple-time guest of the Working Cows podcast, and I think you recognize his value, and I'm glad to have him back on. We're going to talk about the history of sheep in the western United States specifically today and kind of how they came to be here and some of the challenges that they face. So, Dave, thank you for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. Happy to be here, Clay. Thanks for having me. So, I know that you have a a presentation uh, coming up in the near future on the history of the sheep industry. Uh, Could you just share with us a little bit about uh, some of the things, the ideas you're going to be presenting there? Well, sure. Um, South Dakota has a long history in the sheep industry, and I'll be presenting at the Journey Museum first of March uh, about sheep industry in South Dakota and just some you know facts, current facts. Uh, South Dakota ranks about fifth in all sheep and lamb and wool production in the United States. Um, People don't think about that. Um, You know, South Dakota, very unique in its um, geography in that we have the Missouri River dividing us. And so we have intensive farming on the east side of the state and and a lot of rangelands on the west side of the state. But darn if sheep don't fit in both of those schemes and they fit very well and allows South Dakota to have some unique uh, opportunities and advantages that other states don't have. Uh, the, our biggest strengths is that South, D- South Dakota possesses the infrastructure that a lot of our neighboring states don't have to support the industry. And when you start thinking about those other pieces of, of production that's needed for livestock producers uh, to be viable, which would include veterinarians that in, understand sheep, uh, loan officers that understand the value and how a, how a sheep cash flow is going to work, um, you know, the feed uh, experts and nutritionists and the, the feed stores that are willing to handle sheep products, uh, those things all become deal breakers. Uh, the other things that we have that um, we take for granted that other states don't have so accessible are, is uh, we have a, a whole host of sheep shearers, which becomes an important part of our industry because of the need to shear the wool off and the value of the wool. And, and we have wool warehouses and wool experts that can find value in that wool. And this year, again, we're looking at um, those fine wool views having a $35 fleece on their backs, which becomes pretty significant. If you take that times five or six to equal one cow, you're looking at 150 to $180 of, of just wool. And it costs about five bucks to get the wool off. So that becomes a, a pretty good paycheck. Uh, sale barns, you know, livestock marketing opportunities for sheep. Uh, and then, you know, who buys those lambs? And those are feedlots or feeders in eastern South Dakota and in the I-29 corridor, Minnesota and Iowa are full of, of lamb feedlots over there that really support our industry as well as um, we're not that far from uh, all or Weld County, Colorado, which has a lot of lamb feeding facilities as well as the packing plants um, in, in good proximity there. So South Dakota in its geographic location and, and what we have for infrastructure it's, is prime sheep producing country. Uh, how did it get there? Well, you know, as with all the settlement of the Great Plains, you think about what is the one thing that impacted and drove and caused lots of issues in settlement, and that was water. And what is it out in, um, in southeast Montana and 
in western South Dakota and in Wyoming that we lack is water. We're semi-arid to almost desert at some times, <laughs> some spells. Uh, and we don't have a lot of live streams that are flowing in a larger network that we can access. And so that being the case, uh, a lot of the water that is out there is not of the best quality. And sheep being a desert animal fit that landscape much better. Uh, as we develop water, uh, our grasses in the Northern Plains are some of the best grasses in the world for their nutritional density and their ability to carry that and hold that nutrient content year round. And so as we've developed water, we've, we've provided that opportunity to put cattle in places on the Northern Plains that they would not have otherwise been because of the lack of water. So what are some of the challenges that you've talked about a lot of the advantages? What are some of the challenges that Western South Dakota and, and the regions like it, similar to it, present for sheep production? Well, I'm going to say this jokingly because I've lived through them all. And the one thing that uh, the Northern Plains does is, is minimizes its human population because of the weather. And that's, <laughs> that's the same thing with livestock. Uh, we've had some livestock killing blizzards that have really taken a toll over the since settlement uh, in how they've impact livestock numbers. And sheep uh, in this cold weather with the full fleece on do great. There is very little impact to them. They can be out on the prairies grazing and again, um, sedges out there carrying 10 to 12 percent protein they can access them this time of year and it would need very little supplement as compared to a cow uh, however when you get those uh, blizzards that blow in with two feet of snow and 60 to 70 mile an hour winds for two to three days um, you're looking at that sheep hitting its limit in its ability to survive that and they just move with the wind like cattle do and they'll get trapped in fence corners or fall into draws or off off creeks and ravines and then snow under and that's that's been a fact that sheep producers have lived with uh, since the settlement of this part of the country and and so when those blizzards come in and sheep producers really, really take that seriously and try to get uh, those sheep into cover. So how did sheep end up in Western South Dakota? How did they, how did they get here? Well, a couple different directions. Uh, again, looking at both sides of the state, you have a, a, a farmer farm flock production systems moving in to Eastern South Dakota. And the nice thing about uh, sheep as opposed to cattle Again, they can uh, do well on more undesirable forages. So in your poorer ground, you could graze them and then farm your better ground. Likewise, uh, because of the size of the animal, it does not take much to set up uh, corrals and handling facilities for sheep as compared to cattle as far as you know their ability to withstand the, the pressures. So you saw a lot of that uh, come in. Uh, Railroads provided that infrastructure needed to ship uh, those lambs back to um, Chicago and, and Minneapolis and some of those packing areas. That was huge. I can even remember my granddad uh, shipping lambs out of Newell uh, on railroad cars uh, to Huron. At that time, there was a packing plant there um, and went east. So some of that infrastructure was there. And Western South Dakota, sheep actually came from the West. And and if you ever uh, read some of your history books, they tended to make a big circle, uh, and it was based on gold rushes. So you look at uh, um, the California gold rush, they moved in um, hundreds of thousands of more sheep into California, Obviously, the vaqueros had cattle and sheep there before European or American settlers moved over that way. But um, as you increase those populations, 
And again, thinking about a lot of California being desert, they trailed sheep out of Texas and New Mexico to supply food for the miners and all the inhabitants. And then you just start making a circle up to Oregon, and then they had gold strikes in Idaho and Montana, Virginia City, and come around that way and then into the Black Hills. And so the Western Range Jews moved in, in a lot of respects, um, coming out of those parts of the country, Idaho, Utah, um, Western Wyoming, and Montana. What was the form of those sheep when they came in? Were they uh, similar to the sheep we have today? Were they bigger, smaller? Very smaller. Um, in a lot of respects, the Western Range ewes uh, were primarily made up of uh, and had a lot of influences more into the late 1800s of the Rambouillet breeds. Uh, as a lot of them come out of Texas and New Mexico, Arizona, you would have a lot of the Navajo sheep influences there. But as um, you start thinking of the textile fibers that were available in the late 1800s, well, in the 1800s period, uh, cotton and wool. And so mo many of those sheep and a lot of producers in the Northern Plains the lambs weren't the, the valued commodity. It was the wool that uh, really provided the profit because, uh, like I said, they, these guys were running these ewes out on these prairies year-round with little or no supplement and then harvesting that wool once a year. So they had very little into them and so much open range out here. To the point that, as with all the stories of history goes with ranching at that time, both cattle and sheep, they overgraze the prairies horribly. Hmm. So there's that brings me to the question of the strategy, the historical strategy of raising sheep, and how is it different than it was uh, today than it was then? Uh, I'm assuming they were they were raising sheep with less uh, overheads or less infrastructure then than we are now. A lot of the places I'm aware of lamb through a shed and shoot for that 180 to 200 percent lamb crop what what is how does it differ today than it did then well in early 1900s and, and during the settlement of this side of the state again no fencing existed and a lot of fencing didn't really occur till up into the 50s so it was very open range and so how do you identify your your ranch or your entitlement is by rocks and and what have you, but uh, with no fences, they had the need for sheep herders. And so every ranch would have a, a set of herders and they would outfit them with uh, many times what you would call the traditional sheep wagon, but they had line cabins and, and, and other modes of uh, camping out there. And then you had on your ranch, your foreman or your camp tender that would circle around and supply all those herders. And those herders knew what area they were supposed to be grazing in. And then, and ideally, and what a great opportunity, they could move those sheep to fresh grass every day. And then they would trail them two to three miles, if not more sometimes, to a water source. And all the different herders would utilize those uh, that same water source, so you had to take your turn at bringing your sheep to that area. An interesting note out here east of Newell, where I am, on the old, uh, what we call the old Fairpoint Road, or old 212, that goes straight east of Newell, the railroad put in, every 10 miles, they put in a trailing stock dam. So as you trailed your both cattle or sheep into Newell, you would go 10 miles, 12 miles a day, and then you would camp at a dam and bring them in. Those dams still exist out there along that road. And that, that road's um, easement is a lot wider than uh, the other county roads around just for that trailing aspect. Huh. So were they lambing at, at a different time of year then um, in those situations? Yeah, certainly in, in the in the range operations, we're doing a, a more of a May-June lambing um, out on the open prairies. 
work well most times unless you've got into a rainy monsoon type of of year which would cause a lot of issues then because what you have to think about is body mass on lambs uh, lamb born now is eight to nine pounds and it doesn't take a lot for them to chill down as compared to a calf that's say 80 85 pounds there's a lot more body mass before they actually succumb to hypothermia so yes a lot of prairie lambing as um people uh, started fencing areas off and knew that there's that opportunity to get um, more than just one lamb and improve their lambing percentages by management and and labor was more readily available at that time uh, they would start running them through uh, shed lambing scenarios a lot oh, again a lot of which were still in the later springs just because of the weather and the feed resources you know as we became more mechanized and were able to put up more hay and transport more corn in uh, then folks uh, moved their lambings earlier into the winters um, for a number of reasons uh, some of which have to do with uh, trying to hit early markets the early markets for lambs rather than being in the general run some of it has to do with seed stock and some has to do with labor availability at the time what other influences uh what i guess what kind of sheep were they running what breeds of sheep were they running uh early on in the in this part of the country well again as wool was the the bigger commodity they looked at a number of different breeds and it is interesting uh, the different breeds will provide a different fiber diameter of wool and those different fiber diameters provide for that being that wool being used for different applications so a lot of the breeds that were uh, developed and used came from the sheep experiment station in Dubois Idaho which has uh, had over a hundred year history now celebrated its 100th year in 2015. Anyway, uh, they utilized a number of different breeds, but many times the Rambouillet was the, the base breed in which they developed them from. Uh, the Rambouillets, which originated from Rambouillet, France, and were of the Merino descent from the Spanish Merinos, uh, because of, and were highly valued because of their their fine wool and, and the fabrics that you could make from that um, and be and also uh, had a number of other attributes being closer to the equator uh, tended to be more of a desert animal as opposed to the English breeds and uh, also had a, a longer or more year-round breeding season than the English breeds and sheep uh, like deer are photo period sensitive to their breeding times. Anyway, uh, Ramblays were always popular, but tended to be small, you know, too small a sheep. So they uh, in, integrated uh, some of the English breeds like the Lincolns into those and crossed them up and created what we know as the Columbia breed. And then utilizing some of the Columbia establishment and some more Rambouillet influence, uh, developed uh, the Targhee breed. And the sheep experiment station is, is in the Targhee Mountains of Idaho, and hence the name Targhee. So right now we look at the, the two big Western U breeds are the Targhee and the Rambouillets because of the value of the the fine fleeces, the coarse wool that the Columbias had and the Cordales, which were a New Zealand or originated breed, uh, those coarse wool fibers, that industry has been taken up by synthetic fiber so much that there just isn't the value in those wools as there is in the finer wools. The finer wools, those fibers, and those, um, those fibers are made into fabrics that we look at um, for finer, higher-ended uh, clothing like Italian suits. Uh, we're very proud of the fact that a lot of our military dress uniforms are made from wool. 
and that's American wool that they, they have to source. And those come from the northern plains up here. And now we're seeing a resurgence of those wools being utilized into what we call next to skin or base layer garments that a lot of outdoors people utilize because of some of the processing technologies and, and the improvements of the uniformity of the fiber. Uh, we don't have that itch factor that um, wool was negatively associated with. If you wore a wool garment, it was really scratchy or itchy. Uh, the finer fibers have what we call a higher comfort factor, meaning that they have fewer uh, fibers that are greater than 30 micron. And 30 microns kind of the, the number where you start having that that prickle factor, itch factor that we start feeling on the human skin. So we see a lot of people utilizing socks and, and um, long underwear and, and long sleeved and short sleeved shirts as base layer clothing because of the properties of wool's ability to wick away moisture, keep the skin cool, and uh, also you know, provides that thermal layer to keep people warm. The other way, and uh, then uh, wool also has a, a natural antimicrobial uh, property to it that uh, keeps the odors from becoming too repulsive. <laughs> so, how did the when did the lamb meat market take off, and when when did that open up and start to be something that people were also paying a lot of more attention to? Well, it's it's always been there. It's just so much of. Uh, our society is is um, ethnically driven, and so you look at again who are the major settlers uh, were of European descent, more used to cattle as dual purpose rather than sheep. So you would see some of that. Although you know, as you know, England has a, a lot of breeds of sheep, and and even Spain right now has twenty three million sheep. Uh, for their numbers, and that's as compared to 5 million in the United States is quite a contrast. Uh, however, there's always been a market for lamb. It's just that because of the size of the animal and um, cost to slaughter and process are very similar to beef, you're just getting that much more off of a beef animal and muscle. Uh, material so and you know from a packer's point of view it's it's a lot easier to produce that meat product using cattle uh, however um, like we've talked the sheep do a very good job of utilizing forages that may be of lower quality and more undesirable so you're still taking the ability to convert forages into red meat and sheep be providing that wool factor have quite a regenerative story then and that you're taking those undesirable forages grazing them and then and converting them into a usable fiber such as wool really provides a good story for people to hear back to your question regarding the the meat industry Sheep numbers in the United States were at their highest and about the, and peaked um, just after World War II. And again, a lot of that was because of the demand for for meat and wool for the the national defense. And as the synthetic fibers came on and created more comp, a competitive edge with wool, you saw some of that value decrease and and thus the, started the decline of the sheep industry just because of the lack of demand for wool. The demand for lamb meat has always stayed about the same, although we're seeing in recent years, um, as we have more cultural diversity and ethnicity in our country, we're seeing a lot of those folks who have originated from areas of the world that uh, consume lamb and and goat uh, have a greater demand and want for those meats. An uh, interesting fact is that 70% of the world's population eats lamb and goat. It's, it's just not us. 
that makes sense. You start to think about it. Where do you find the concentration of the world's population? And that's along the equator. And what is a lot of that environment like along the equator? Well, it's a lot of it's a desert or, or at least semi-arid. And so what animals do you find there? Sheep and goats and, and some cattle. So you can see some of those cultural histories that start to impact just like they have in the development of our country show up here. So, but, and as we see with the newer generations, uh, after World War II, the, the old story, as it's always gone, uh, a lot of the servicemen that came home, especially that had fought and served in the, Euro, or excuse me, in the Pacific Theater, uh, ate a lot of what we would call mutton from Australia. In, in that case, was a lot of old weathers. <laughs> Australia was is in still huge in wool production, and at that time raised a lot of weathers for nothing but wool. So the tallow factor, or that off flavor that we can have in lamb or mutton meat due to the, the fat residue that hadn't been drained away can be pretty profound, especially in older sheep. So uh, a lot of those servicemen had and did not want anything to do with uh, lamb meat when they returned for a number of reasons. You know, as that generation is passing, uh, the, the newest generations are, are more adventure seeking, both in their food experiences as well as other things. And we're seeing uh, a renewed interest in, in that eating experience with lamb. And uh, with uh, folks buying good American lamb, they find that there, there is a very good, enjoyable eating experience with it. So how do you see the future of this industry, I guess, as we've talked a little bit about the history in the West? How do you see, what do you see as the future? And then the second question, this is going to be workingcows.net slash 81. Would you like me to put anything up there or anything you want to share with people as they are just wanting to learn a little bit more? So some immediate resources that uh, folks can um access to find out about the history of the sheep industry in South Dakota is the South Dakota or SDSU's uh, South Dakota Agricultural Museum on the campus of, of Brookings. And they actually did a, an exhibit here uh, a couple of years ago on the sheep industry in South Dakota and did an excellent job to, and received several national awards for that display in their, in their investigations and the presentations of those histories. So that's a good place to start. What do we see? The sheep, the future of the sheep industry has a has a very unique and great opportunity in the United States, as I see it, uh, we, from a, a very sustainable, regenerative application and how we start approaching our new paradigm of what agriculture is. And I'm, I'm leading up to soil health and rangeland health, which I really believe is a, quite a game changer. And we'll be talking about it uh, 40 years from now as folks talk about what the, what the New Deal did in the 40s to uh, in the NRCS or what at that time was the SCS did to um, improve conservation of our natural resources. And and having livestock integrated into cropland systems as part of that tool to improve soil health, but also as part of the uh, enterprise return in, in, in dollars and cents, uh, I think sheep really have an opportunity to play a role there uh, because you're able to graze some residues with little animal impact on the soil but at the same time cycle those nutrients and and on my own operation that's where i'm headed is to try to get to a point uh, where a person doesn't have to have a lot of dependency on fossil fuels in the forms of diesel or chemical fertilizer and we know that it's just a matter of time that that as those fuel prices go up and supplies become short that that can really uh, hinder our national defense. 
and our obviously our our national economy. So if we can get agriculture to be better prepared to not be so dependent on those resources and at the same time maintain our food production and fiber production, we have a, a, a very good opportunity utilizing sheep to do that. Very good. Appreciate that a lot. Uh, recently, I had an episode, actually just last week, we had we had episode 78 with Trent Stout, and we talked about soil health. And uh, he mentioned that he, in Iowa, doesn't know where he would go to find livestock to integrate onto cropland. Do you think that with somebody like that, I've, you're the best person I know to ask this question, so I'm going to ask you, uh, with soil like that, where they've got feet of topsoil, is the is the depletion more of a risk when they deplete those those soil life uh, in in something with that much topsoil? Does it take longer to get it back, or do they just have that much more of a buffer? Is it is are they is that just an asset that they have that they can they can farm in an extractive way rather than a regenerative way and not have a risk of of losing that soil life? Does that make sense? Yes, it makes absolute sense. It- I could I could look like a really good farmer too if I had twenty six inches of rainfall every year. <laughs> it's it's all a function of moisture, and the the semi arid areas out here where we're at with you know fifteen inches of rainfall, soil health and these practices have made a huge difference in consistency from year to year in production and in developing organic matter faster than what they claimed we could do. The folks in, in those deep topsoils in Minnesota and Iowa have a, a different situation there. Their, their organic matters aren't always the challenge. Uh, it's, it's their soil function in that a number of things are happening that aren't positive and and one is they're not capturing and holding that chemical fertilizer they're putting in and then therefore even the chemicals they're using pesticides are contaminating the groundwater because they've got mm-hmm. those high water tables uh, soil health will address a lot of those you'll stabilize your mineral movements and you you put livestock on there um, which um, that's just a matter of time if you put money to it and again, like I said, it doesn't. For most of us, you can think back to 2008 when we were paying four dollars and twenty-eight cents a gallon for diesel fuel, and that um, fertilizers were up over a thousand dollars a ton. That any way you can reduce them, whether that improves your organic matter or not, is going to improve your bottom line. And so, soil health makes sense on so many different levels uh, to ensure a future in agriculture for each individual producer that you just have to figure out how it, it's going to best serve you. <clears throat> so I think that's where they're missing out on some of those opportunities. Yeah, it's a want to. Um, you you get in a situation where you're needing another enterprise to provide some revenue because the margins on corn aren't there or beans aren't there. And livestock provides this opportunity to graze. And what a what a, a neat thing, I think, of grazing on cropland where I'm not concentrating manure in a, in a feedlot. And I don't have to haul that manure out and I don't have to haul that hay in. And it's going, the ammonia is going right into the soil and the nitrate nitrogen that's coming out in the, in the fecal material. Is sitting on top with the residue and mixing in. I I can't see any better way to do that. That's the way these prairies naturally function, in, in Iowa included in that uh, over all those years. It's just that they had the rainfall to grow the tall grasses that um, created the huge biomasses and the soil functioning that created the topsoils there and the organic banners that we could, you know, just can't fathom. But it is impressive in the 20 years that I've done some of this that within the last 5 to 10 where I've really concentrated on the soil health, I've moved more in those five years than I did in the first 15 hmm. years. Hmm. Well, Dave, thanks for your time today. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to sit down and, and get a little bit of this history on the sheep industry. You bet. Thank you for having me, Clay.
I've got a really interesting next couple of weeks uh, planned for you guys. Uh, where we're going over the next week is I think I'm going to have a couple of more bonus episodes for you with um, Arnells and Nash. Uh, interestingly enough, he just passed away this last week, uh, but I was able to sit down with him and record an episode with him on kind of the history of the money and banking and credit system in America. And then there's a, a pretty tightly tied into that companion episode with El Carlos Lara about the infinite banking concept, which we've touched on with Mary Jo Ehrman a couple of times with Farming Without the Bank. But we're going to take a real deep dive into that. And I would ask you to look at those opportunities more as almost webinars and classes that you're going to sit down and take notes on because it's some really incredible stuff and, and really, I think, some stuff that can prepare you for the future. So I'd ask you to tune in to those bonus episodes. Don't let them pass you by and take the time to listen to them when you have some time to sit down and take some notes because those guys are going to really help us out and uh, really just feel privileged to have been able to sit down and, and capture Nelson Nash's thoughts for an hour or so uh, before his passing. And and I know, you know, given his testimony that he is uh, with Jesus and he's in, enjoying the presence of the Lord and that he is, has received his blessing uh, for a, a life lived uh, in devotion to Jesus this side of eternity. But um, again, just a privilege to be able to share that with you guys. And uh, so just be on the lookout for that over the next couple of weeks, two bonus episodes. And then this main episode that's going to come out next week is an episode with uh, one of the founders of Beef Chain, uh, which is a blockchain traceability tool, not a government mandated traceability tool, but a, a free market traceability tool for the beef industry that I think has some really, really huge potential for power and uh, really good stuff there. So I would really encourage you to to tune in for that episode and also to tune in for a webinar that we will be announcing in the near future uh, in tandem with that episode. We're going we're gonna to schedule a webinar for people to sit down and join uh, and to be walked through Beef Chain and how they could implement it on their operation. So um, I want to do the episode first and then hopefully we'll drive some interest for that webinar coming up in the near future. So busy couple of weeks here on the Working Cows podcast and, and really look forward to serving you with some content that can really be practically inputted into the financial future of your family and also uh, practically help you have, with the value proposition that you are sending forward to the next person in the supply chain of your critters. So uh, just Make sure you're subscribed at workingcows.net slash subscribe so that you're not missing any of these episodes, bonus episodes or otherwise. Some really good stuff from these people that I've had the opportunity to sit down with over the last few weeks. And I would ask you to, to tune in and to take notes and prepare to join us for that webinar coming up in the near future. So look forward to this uh, next couple of weeks on the Working Cows podcast. Thanks. We invite you to visit WorkingCows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week.